All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join ye in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shieldeth thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires e'er have been granted in what he ordaineth? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. Right on time, late again. I, I got this mic right here. I guess. I don't think I'm gonna go walking around. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this Sabbath day and for the word that you've given us to teach us about you and your character. Open our minds now as we open your word in Jesus' name, amen. Today we're doing lesson nine in the present truth about Deuteronomy. called Turn Their Hearts. Okay. And our memory text is Deuteronomy 429. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him, and you'll, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Where do you remember hearing that in the Bible? Jeremiah 29.13 says, And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. Who else said it? Where do you think Jesus got it? Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm out of order, so. I think it was, was it in Mark? Where Jesus said, when, when you search for me, you will find me with all your heart. He used the same words. I'll, I'll get to it when, as soon as I go through this. Um, I have it written down in here somewhere. I just can't see it right now. Somebody's writing is bad. <laughs> okay, so 
seeking God. Are we seeking God or is God seeking us? He's pursuing us. We're not the ones seeking God. The only reason we turn to God is because he's seeking us, because he's calling us and we hear his voice and we turn to him. There is none that seek God, no, not one, right? We've all gone astray. And Jesus said in John 12, 32, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. And then uh, in Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And it all, it all leads to repentance. All of, our, all of what we see on our side as seeking God leads us to repentance and changing of our lives through Jesus Christ. Christ changes us. And repentance is acknowledging our sin, being sorry for the sin, asking forgiveness for it, and ultimately turning away from it. And then on Sunday's lesson, it's this, I, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, Mayitin or Mayitin. But it says, Me is who, and Yitin is will give. So it literally means who will give. <coughs> but like, <coughs> like all Hebrew words, they have about four or five, six meanings, different ways you can say them depending on the context of what they're being used in. Like in, they give the example in, in Exodus 16, 16, 3, if only we had died in, by the Lord's hand in Egypt, the phrase, if only, came from my itin. And then in Psalms 14, 7, David utters, oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. The Hebrew doesn't say, oh, it says my itin. So, it depends on how you use it as to which word is used to interpret it. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, 22 to 29, who wants to read that? Do you want to read it, Warren? These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man, and yet he still lives. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? You go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say, and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Okay. The question is in the quarterly is focusing especially on verse 29. What does it mean that the word translated as O oh, comes from my it? And Anybody? Well, 
Well, in, in the, the question on Sunday's lesson, in the middle, focusing especially on Deuteronomy verse 29, what does it mean that the word translated as O oh comes from Mayitin? No, verse 29 is, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and their children forever. So here's God saying, if only God, I mean, this is God speaking, you would expect he could say, well, make it so. Yeah. Yeah. He, of all in the universe, is saying, if only. I wish. I wish it would be this way. Yeah. But he knows that it's not going to be that way, because he knows the end from the beginning. <coughs> and I, I wrote, it depends on the context as to what word is used to translate God will give. Uh, and it's this is where God is, is exercising our free will. I wish they would do this, but he knows that we're not going to do that. And we're not going to always keep all the commandments that it will be well with them. So God is exercising our free will and allowing us to make these mistakes. Free choice, yeah. And it's our choice. Because he said that um, to me that always like an invitation, you know, wanting people, he's wanting to draw us to him. And when we are totally surrendered, that's when happiness comes. You know, we might, I remember years ago looking at the Ten Commandments and sometimes we put the cart before the horse and we focus on only one, the only one that says remember, but all the rest of them are very important as well, you know. Um, even to our fellow men, if we love them, we're going to totally treat them with respect and also respect ourselves because God made us that, uh, in a way that he can help us you know, when we totally surrender to him. And at the bottom it says, just as we humans are free to sin, we are also free to choose the Lord, to choose to be open to his leading, to choose by responding to his spirit, to repent from our sins and follow him. Ultimately, the choice is ours and ours alone. It is a choice that we have to make day by day and moment by moment, which is basically what you were saying. Choosing to follow God. Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because the commandments will bring us happiness. Yeah. And, and you know, that's something we learn by practicing, you know, following him. Yeah, there, there are places in here where it says, if you follow me, you're good. If you don't, these bad things will happen. And I think that's where people get the idea that God's standing there with a lightning bolt saying, uh, don't do that. Bad things are going to happen. I'll, I'll zot you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. He's there with the. He's there to uh, teach you. Yeah, but it's a natural consequence of sin. Is what is what we experience. Bruni had a question or an answer. Or I was just gonna say what you just got done saying. Um, what we sow, we will reap. The Bible says. Yeah. Uh, do good, but when we do bad, we reap the consequences. So, in a sense, 
we should expect, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised when bad things happen. For example, if someone struggles with smoking and then they repented and they stopped, so here they are 20 years later with cancer, scratching their head going, you know, I'm good now, what happened? It's like, well, for the first 20 years of your adult life, you smoked cigarettes. Why should you be surprised you have cancer? Yeah. So there's consequences <coughs> to sin. Uh, same thing with, um, you know, like maybe for me, well, I had too many pieces of pie. So guess what? I get to wear it on my belly and on my buttocks. That's the consequence of overeating. You know, and it's the same with sin. You, you, why should you expect that life is going to be all good? You know, it took... Uh, one of the sermons I heard in relation to this study was uh, a pastor made a comment that it took 40 years. You know, it took a moment to turn to God, but it took 40 years for his people to change. You know, it, it, it took a lifetime of them to get there, but in order for them to be changed, it took 40 years. It took 40 years to take out the bad. Yeah. And Mondays, um, seek me and find me. Oh, and that's this my itten thing on the other, on Sundays. Who will give? I, I wrote, God will give. God gives us everything. Our, our ability to repent, our ability to follow him all comes from God. And we'll see that here as we go. Monday's lesson is seek me and find me. God knows the end from the beginning and he knows when we will abandon him. When we're wise, we seek Christ. That's where, you know, um, how does um, Psalm say? Psalm says it, uh, when we seek God, we have wisdom. There's all wisdom comes from God. Yep, all wisdom comes from God. Uh, uh, <coughs> Um, Solomon, that's what I was thinking of. Solomon, he, he got all of his wisdom from God. Right? Well, <laughs> in that part he wasn't wise. He, he was not following God there. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but uh, we are to seek the Lord with all our hearts and with all our soul, and we will find him. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.29 and Jeremiah 29.13, seek me, you, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. And that leads to repentance and to seeing our need for a Savior. In John 15.5, without me you can do nothing. We can't even repent without God. God gives us the repentance we need. Because for without me, you can do nothing. Acts 5, 31. Uh, him has God exalted with his right hand. <coughs> I can't read my own writing. Let's go to, let's turn to John 5, 15, 15 5. <laughs> 
I can see what I wrote. <coughs> Is that right? For without me you can do nothing. Yeah. Oh, it's Acts 5.31, sorry. Him hath God exalted to his right hand to be a prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and for forgiveness of sins. That, and listen, listen to the words. God has exalted to his right. Him, him God has exalted to his right hand to be a prince and savior. Talking about Jesus. To give repentance. So God gives us the ability to repent. To give repentance to Israel and for forgiveness of sins. And we are the Israel of God today, <clears throat> right? And then Luke 3, 8 says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. So the repentance God gives us, we are to obey him and bring forth fruits worthy of that repentance that was given us. There's two different kind of repentance. One is fearful of what's going to happen to you, and the other one is you're s totally sorry that what happened. And I think when we're totally sorry, we're <coughs> humbled, and that's a gift from God. Yeah. Yeah. And Judas had the wrong kind of repentance. That wasn't repentance. He was sorry for what he did because of the consequence of what was going to happen, but he didn't, he wasn't sorry for the sin itself. in my <coughs> life and I think when we're you know when when we do the one that we're fearful of what's going to happen to us that doesn't bring out much fruit because it makes us feel worse than but when we're totally sorry that's a gift from God that you know humbles ourselves yeah it doesn't bring forth any fruit at all it only brings forth death as you just found out. And King David. I always go to King David because he's a great example for bad examples. <laughs> it, he, he sinned and he repented of his sin and he turned from it, but he still got the consequence. He still had the th bad things happen to him because of his sin. Just because we sin and we repent, everything's not going to go back to great again. You still have to reap the reward of the bad choice. It's like Prunie said, you smoke for 20 years and you give it up and you no longer smoke anymore. Well, you got lung cancer. Well, hello. It's a, re it's a consequence of what you did before. God will help you be able to go through that. Yes. So that's a... That's and even honest. if it kills you and you still follow God, it's still okay mm -hmm. in the long run. Short run's not too good, but the long run, it will work. Warren? And I think people might wonder, well, why doesn't God take away all the consequences? Well, what would happen if he did? People would just turn to God just to escape consequences, not right. out of a true change of heart. Yeah, instead of have a true change of heart, they would just want to not, not suffer the consequences. Yeah. Tuesdays is, is repent. And I'll massacre this too. It's teshuva. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. 
For he who sows his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And that's what Prudy was talking about. As a man sows, so shall he reap. <clears throat> and you go to Acts 3, since we're in Acts 5, skip back to Acts 3.19. <clears throat> Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. <coughs> Repent and be converted. So we have to repent before we can be converted. And what does it mean to be converted? Well, uh, the dictionary says it's to change, to turn, to transform, to transfigure, to translate, to adapt, rework, recast, reshape, refashion. Like a caterpillar turning to a butterfly. That's a good analogy. So when we repent, we change through Christ, through Christ's help. We change. Yeah. They, well, they turned to God. That was repentance. But it took 40 years to take Egypt out of them. Now you're talking about justification and sanctification. We're justified freely by his grace. That's instantaneous. God justifies us instantly. But salvation or sanctification takes a lifetime. Sanctification is change of our attitudes and lives to be like God. That's conversion. I like the story of this person that got baptized. And he went to church and he made, oh, they were having potluck, so he made a big pot of beans and they said what's the secret in ingredient and he just became an Adventist and he said it's for the beans you know you get a can I remember long ago we had a <laughs> can of uh, beans and they had one piece of pork on top and <laughs> my brothers used to always comment on that but you know when we've made it you don't make that change right away but you know he took a, when he recognized that you know, he wasn't supposed to be eating pork. He made changes. So later on, you know, he brought beans without pork in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And this repent and be converted so we actually need to be converted every day this is something that um, we lay ourselves down at, at the altar of Christ every morning you know, and ask him to change us and, and keep transforming us yeah we, we repent daily God. Um, Paul says I die daily he turned to God daily You know, who was Paul? He was Saul. You know, some people probably were kind of scared to um, go and listen to him, but he totally made a change, and he, you know, he brought a lot of people to Christ because they saw the change in him. Yeah. And repent. Some synonyms for repent is free or remorse for, Regret, rue, be ashamed of, see the error of one's ways. So we repent, and once we repent, God can work with us to be converted. Uh, Jesus told Peter, after he was with him for three and a half years, just before he went to the cross, he goes, when you are converted. <laughs> and he was with him for three and a half years, and he still wasn't converted. 
So conversion doesn't happen instantaneously. Justification happens instantaneously, but sanctification takes time. Um, it says Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 10. Let's switch to Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 10. Okay, that now when it come to pass, when all these things shall come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you and who persecute you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. If the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the pre produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, so there's all the same language. Turn to God with all your heart and with all your soul. And if we do that, God will prosper us and good things will happen. If we turn away from him, he will, he will turn away from us and bad things will happen. Not by God's hand, because God won't be with us. It's not God that brings the evil on people. He brings the good but when we turn from him, he can't protect us from the evil and the evil one. We all know who that is, right? So with all your heart, And here's where we get the circumcision of the heart is from verse 6. And the Lord, will Lord your God will circumcise your heart. That's the new covenant. I will write the laws in, in your heart. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. That's what God tells us, right? That's the new covenant. It's interesting in the New Testament when uh, Paul, especially in Galatians, says things like you know, circumcision is of the heart and, and so on and points out that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing it's it's the heart that counts he wasn't making something up new he was just bringing out what god had said here in deuteronomy right. he read he read uh, deuteronomy 30 <laughs> <clears throat> 
And I like this at the end of uh, Wednesday's lesson, out of Patriarchs and Prophets. The people mourned because of their sins, because their sins had brought suffering upon themselves, but not because they had dishonored God by transgression of his holy law. True repentance is more than sorrow for sin. It is the resolute turning away from evil, which is what you were saying. Um, you can be sorrow, sorry for your sin and repent because you're sorry for your sin and for the consequence of it, but that's not true repentance. True repentance is turning away from evil completely. And we have a hard time with that because our carnal minds like sin. If sin wasn't likable to our carnal minds, nobody would do it, right? Right? So sin is, to our carnal minds, sin is good, tastes good, feels good, smells good, looks good. Otherwise, nobody would do it. If it, was, if it wasn't good, nobody would do it. So. But we turn from, turn from that sin and listen to God and allow him to work in our lives and give us the power to repent and be converted and that's Thursday's lesson is repent and be converted Mark 1 15 is repent ye and believe the gospel the good news of salvation repent the repentance and, re and the gospel go hand in hand And uh, the lesson's bringing out that repent means to return to God. And Matthew 3, 1 to 8, let's turn there. Matthew 3, 1 to 8. Can somebody read that? In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, then saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a feather, uh, leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Okay. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he ate grasshoppers and honey, right? Wrong. He ate fruit from the locust tree. That's what it means. Now, everybody, everybody at the time this was written knew that. They didn't think he really ate grasshoppers. <coughs> And they were, and everybody that John preached to, most of them were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And then he looks over at the Pharisees and Sadducees that were out there to see see what they could uh, get against him. He said, "Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come?" So it's. Quite interesting to say that to your congregation, right? <clears throat> and he says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, when you... Uh, you turn to God, 
You repent, you confess, let's go to the scene and celebrate. <laughs> right? Wrong. <laughs> you bear fruits worthy of repentance. You give up all those things that are that will hurt you. And that the God says will not be good for you. Um, don't eat those things that are going to cause your body harm. Don't drink those things that will cause your body harm. Don't smoke things that will cause your body harm. Don't put things into your lungs that are going to hurt you. you Bring totally forth fruits worthy of repentance. When you totally repent, your life's going to show it and people are going to see it. You know, you're not going to go back and live the way you did before you got baptized. Yeah, and they will ask, why are you so weird? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be a square than a circle. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Thursdays is repent and be converted. The return to God. Verse 3, 1, Matthew 3, 1 to 8. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Turn to God and show. When we bear fruits, everybody will see that fruit and know that we have changed our lives. But it's not us who has changed it. It's really God who has changed it. It's Jesus in us that has changed us. The Holy Spirit in us. And sometimes along that line, sometimes we try to make the changes ourselves, and then in pride we kind of get lifted up. I think like Peter walking on the water, taking our eyes off Jesus, and then when we fall, God sometimes lets us fall so that we realize our need of him. Sometimes? Every time. <laughs> Every time we get on our uh, all the time, he does, he does let us fall so that we can turn back to him. Okay, Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. But then a lot of Adventist chil children, you know, that aren't, I think that's why we have a lot, of, a lot of young people in church because we didn't really claim the promises and, you know, really cling to Jesus. And now, um, because the stories that are told in the Bible, they're so awesome, you know, all the miracles and how God took care of his people. I used to always wish, man, I, I wish I grew up Adventist my whole life because these things can be really embedded in you. Yet, when we teach our children to be, to learn about God, when they grow up, they're not, they're going to come back to it. They're going to come back to what they were taught when they were growing up. Yeah. We promise because, you know, we care about our children. Yes. And God's promised that he will bring them back, so, you know, don't get discouraged. And we can only hope that they will return to God. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a saying, a saying that God has no grandchildren. Yes. We all have to be his children, even if, you know, it's our children, our grandchildren, whatever level, we all have to have that personal relationship. Yes, and it is a personal relationship. It's Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I like that. Yeah. Isaiah 55, 6. You know, before they followed the star. Yeah. They were, they were right in tune. They were studying all along. They didn't... Um, you know, they were searching for God. Nobody preached to them. 
They study for themselves, and that's yeah. what we need to do as well, you know. Yeah, and <coughs> like like Warren said, there are no grand. God does, has no grandchildren; He only has children, and we have to study for ourselves in order to become children of God. We can't just be told something and then believe it. We have to study it out of the Word of God for ourselves and come to the conclusion that God is worthy of being followed and follow Him from, from our own study of the Bible. And God gives strength to the ones that are studying because He will, when we, like in Revelation, you know, when we start reading, it, it gives us more strength and encouragement and to go forward with living, living a life for God. Yeah. And <clears throat> our, our uh, carnal minds want to do something to be saved. In Acts 2.37, let's flip up to Acts 2.37 real quick. And verse 36, <coughs> Peter's preaching. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's another part of it. Repent and be baptized and be converted, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized and don't stop there. Keep moving forward. Yeah, don't stop there. Repent, get baptized, and then, then go to the CN and celebrate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, it, you repent and be baptized, and then you turn to Christ and you and you follow Him, and you do, and you uh, have have uh, worthy of repentance. I lost my place. <laughs> uh. So the repenting is turning away from sin, sinful ways, and the gospel is living in the newness of life in Christ. That's what I got out of it. It's a conscious choice from turning away from our sins. Right? It's a choice we have to make daily. Like Paul says, I die daily. And then uh, Romans 2, 4. The goodness of God leads to repentance. When we study the Bible and we study how good God is and what he's done for us, it leads us to repentance. And in Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn thee. God draws us and leads us to repentance. It's God that does it, not us. We just respond to the call. Right? And then on Friday, uh, I like this at the very top. It says, at every advanced step in Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. So our, repentant con our repentance continues as we get 
as we know more and more about God, our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom the Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. Ezekiel 36, 31. So the more you know about God, the more you see his goodness, and the more you see our, our evilness, the worse you'll feel. <clears throat> uh, the, the worse you'll feel about yourself. Right. But not, not to the point of discouragement, to the, but to the point of clinging to God, knowing that he's the only one who can save me. Realizing that we need a savior and we have to cling to him harder and harder and harder because the more we look at ourselves and the more we find out about the goodness of God and the evilness of ourselves, the more we need to cling to him. The more we need him. We come into a church, right? We, we come into a body of believers and not everybody in the church is converted. And sometimes that there's pain in yeah. the church it's different maybe in the bar you know you go to the bar and everybody loves you and you're the life of the party and all that <laughs> stuff but god has converted you now and you come to the church and it's it's can be can, can be difficult at times to grow it is yet. it is difficult to grow yeah. it, you're you're right it is difficult to grow it's not a cakewalk god doesn't say everything is going to be easy that's why they call it the growing pains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, that's all I have. God draws us, and we respond to that call. We turn to him. He leads us to repentance, and we bear fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and your and the power of your word that lead, that gives us the ability to repent. And thank you for knocking at our door of our heart and calling to us. Help us to all answer that call in Jesus name. Amen. God is good all the time. Let's continue our singing this morning with number 120. There's a song in the air. 120. There's a song in the air, there's a star in the sky, there's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry, and the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of Bethlehem, cradles a king. There's a tumult of joy or the wonderful birth For the virgin sweet boy is the Lord of the earth I the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing For the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king 
In the light of that star lie the ages impearled, and that song from afar has swept over the world. Every hearth is aflame, and the beautiful sing in the homes of the nations that Jesus is King. We rejoice in the light, and we echo the song that comes down through the night from the heavenly throng. I we shout for the lovely evangel they bring, and we greet in his cradle our Savior and King. Next, let's sing number 122, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 122. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. In the manger born a King, while adoring angels sing. Peace on earth to men good will, bid the trembling soul be still. Christ on earth has come to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. This may not be a traditional Christmas song, but I'd like to sing number 461, especially because it fits with the title of the pastor's sermon, but also the message of Christ in our hearts. Be still, my soul. Number 461. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. 
Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. And now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. His voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past. All safe and blessed we shall meet at last. You know, I don't like change because I don't like surprises. In, in too many times they seem to be bad surprises. And maybe I'm a little pessimistic about them. But... I will be looking forward to the one good change when we get to be with our Lord forever. And then all of those surprises that are not so good will be over. But the wonderful surprise, the blessing of Jesus coming to our earth will always be celebrated throughout eternity. Let's sing number 124, Away in a Manger. 124. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky looked down where he lay, the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky, and stay by my side till the morning is nigh. Lord Jesus, I ask Thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in Thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with Thee there. Good morning, everyone. How was everybody's Thanksgiving? Was it good? Amen. I spent it with two different families this week. I ran from one place to another. It was very nice. Thank you for your hospitality and your love. And, and oh, that's right. My wife says an amazing food. <laughs> and I told Gina, don't take anything home. But you know what? She snuck a little bit home, I see. But I got to taste a little bit more of it yesterday. Yes. I know. <laughs> Thank you for, for, for doing that. Amen. I want to just encourage you to remember that, um, un, to read your bulletin. Make sure you don't forget to read your bulletin. It's not just for today, but it's to put on your refrigerator so that you can remember. And that is the 6th, we're going to have a community concert. So the community is coming together and putting this concert on. I'm not doing anything. I, I think you're going to be playing the piano, right? That's about all. Maybe you're singing too. No. <laughs> but come and enjoy. It's at 6.30, and it'll be a beautiful concert. We have different people from the community coming, and we just love to see the church full with all of us. Amen? Um, 
Monday night at 6.30. Thank you, yes. It's one of the first clicks there she put down. And then uh, <clears throat> the 11th is a big day, the 11th. Remember, the 11th is a big day. It's, we're going to have a lot of Christmas meal. We're going to have a lot of singing and different things, and it's going to be a really good Sabbath. It's going to be one of those high Sabbaths. We're going to be busy all day. And I'm glad that, you know, you know, in the lower 48, people live like 40 minutes or 50 minutes away from the church. We don't all live that far, so we can always go home and come back if we want to. You're only 5 to 10 minutes away. Amen? So there'll be a lot of things we can do that Sabbath. And then I'm going to, if you don't mind elders, I'm going to cancel the meeting. The elders meeting, is that okay? Oh, is that fine? <laughs> Unless you really want it. We might have to talk afterwards, but we probably won't. But yeah, but it'll be a good night. We'll cancel that part of it and then board meeting the next day. And uh, the 21st of January, I'm going to talk about next year. The 21st of January, we're going to be doing a communion. It'll be a little bit different than we've ever done. And you got to come. We're going to ask you to bring your favorite soup to it. And you say, communion with soup? I've never heard of communion with soup. Well, come and see. You'll enjoy it on the 21st. It'll be very nice. It'll be very, a lot of fellowship. I, in 2022, I want to get us to come together more and to fellowship more and to have time together more. Because you know that you grow more as you have fellowship together. Amen? It's very, very true. Is there any, any, I'm missing, any announcements I'm missing? So that's why I said in the beginning, make sure you read your bulletin. Read your bulletin, Jim. Please stand for our opening hymn, number 121, Go Tell It on the Mountain. 121. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent watch by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lonely trembled, when low above the earth, rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Earth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ is born and brought us God's salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. You may be seated. Good morning, and happy Sabbath. Today's offering is for the Alaska Conference's YES program. And YES means, in this case, the <coughs> youth, evangelism, and schools. And it's a program that's uh, targeted toward young folks 
I believe from the grades of seventh through the high school grades. And it's basically trying to prepare young folks to be witnesses in the villages throughout Alaska. I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful program. I wish we could see more evidence of it here in our region, and perhaps that will happen with our offerings here today. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless our offering today, magnify it, and help our conference find those who would be willing to come to our region to be witnesses and to help our youth find you. I ask for these things in Jesus' name, amen. Time for praise and prayer. And we have much to be thankful for. Even though Thanksgiving was past, we can still express our thanks and our praise to our Lord. Does anyone have a praise or a thanks or a prayer that you would like to share together? Jackson, prayer for Jackson's family, and thanks for the warm building, even though it is cold. John, would you like to come up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing your job. I'll let you finish. Any other praises and prayers? Your furnace is working. That's oh, that's so important. Heat. You, you, you appreciate heat in times like this. That is very true. Any other praises and prayers? Yes, Gina. a lot of things. Yeah, Dea. Spoken, yeah. Pruny.
It's great. He's got a good team, huh? Bernard. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll keep you in your prayer. Yeah, Pastor. Good. Any other praises and prayers? Hey, yeah, Warren. <laughs> so that's Dan's boy. Okay. Yeah, May. Great. <laughs> yes. That's, that's great. Um, any other praises or prayers? Okay, at this time, if you're able, we'll, we'll kneel in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and kindness towards us. We pray that you'll guide us. Have you heard our prayers lifted up to you today? We pray for Bernard and his um, his situation. We pray for uh, the people understand and we'll, we'll, everyone will treat him kindly. We thank you for all your blessings. We pray for our families and our friends. You heard the people that are struggling and the people that have been in accidents that you will be with them today. And we pray for Charlie that he is that he is uh, that you're with him. And we thank you for the medical professionals that that heal us and who use your guiding hand and knowledge to heal us. And we thank you for all your blessings. We pray that we can do your will. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. <laughs> We get another special music that we're going to sing together, number 125. And uh, I'll give you the opportunity to stand again if you'd like. You don't have to if you don't want to, but it'd be nice to stand and sing this song, number 125, 
Joy to the World, 125. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. You may be seated. Sorry about that. Uh, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. And it is Psalm 46, verse, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Good morning. Isn't it beautiful out today? It's the sun is out. Amen. <laughs> I know it's not the warmest out. It's gone down to about uh, 20. Was it 20 below it was? I know at my house it was like 17, 18. So it was a little chilly out. But praise the Lord. We're warm in here. I think May said that. We're warm in here. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for your many blessings. These blessings you've given us because you love us. The blessing of having food upon our tables, the blessing of having, having you in our lives, and blessing for just being with us and taking care of us. We thank you for these things, and we, we ask that you just draw us, Lord, closer to you and bring your Holy Spirit into this room today as we talk about being quiet and listening to you, we pray in your name. Amen. I just want to remind you, and I've... And maybe next week we'll do this, but uh, 
we're doing the year end giving. We're giving all our money to the school. So if you want to participate in any way and give some money to the school and help them in any way, we would love that. There's a lot of projects that are going on. And also, year, I, I wanted to say, Sue L put a video together. It's a really good video on uh, the Thanksgiving for kids, the kids in their school and what they did for Thanksgiving. I may show that next week. I'll ask Sue Well about it. But it's a really, uh, really good blessing. I really appreciated what she did with that video and stuff. So I just want you to maybe get with her and ask her if you haven't seen it, if you can see it. But it's beautiful. My wife and her and, and a bunch of them put it all together. And it was really very nice. I want to focus our attention today on that scripture. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Life is loud, seemingly even louder during this time of the season. It's seemingly louder. The, the radio gets louder, the television gets louder, and the you know, cars driving down the road and people moving. And I remember being on the hill up here and hearing the, the Alaskan air flying off. It seems like the, that's one of the highest and the loudest spots in town. You can hear the, the, that jet go flying off. It seems very loud. Even the, you know, even the, sometimes when you're in, your, in our house, we can hear the, you know, that, that high-pitched plane, small planes taking off from the place. It's loud, very loud flying. It, you know, it's interesting, even being in this grocery store, and as you're in a grocery store, you can hear the baby on the next aisle crying and crying and crying. We realize as we live life that life is loud. Have you ever asked yourself why these people take, don't quiet that situation down? It's interesting, even when you look at life and its loudness, have you ever, you watch TV and all of a sudden the commercial comes down on and everybody tells you, click it, turn it down, turn it off, silence it, because it's seemingly the loudest part of the program. It's crazy. Remember, I was, I was with uh, Bernard and, and, and his dad and we were out shopping. We, I went up to Electric to pick them up and everything and they were out shopping and by the time we got to Bigfoot, right, Bernard, you're about frazzled. You're like, this is ridiculous. It's so loud. I don't know if it was loud, but it was just all these people coming at you because at AC, the, it was like the, the, every aisle was like this. You were shopping going through the aisles. I think we went at the busiest time of the day, didn't we? It was very, very loud and frustration in there. As we focus today on the being quiet, I, I, I took the liberty a couple years ago, as I put this together years ago, uh, about the decimal levels. What are decimal levels? A decimal level is like from 1 to 195, from a whisper to a very loud sound. You know, uh, it's interesting, but, but when you're, you're uh, you got your cell phone on, and you're and you're in a meeting and you know that the decimal levels are pretty loud when you're in a board meeting and your phone is the only one that goes off. <laughs> and everybody's looking at you because it's seemingly your phone is the only phone in that room. It's not that, but your phone is the one that made the loudest noise at, at about 60 to 70 decimals. Or 80 decimals, I should say. You know, it's like traffic is about 85 decimals. A train whist whistling down the tracks at 500 feet from you is about 90 decimals. When it gets to 200 feet, it's about 95 decimals. It's loud. When you, are, when you start losing your hearing is when 107 to 90 to 95, I should say, was when you start losing your hearing when you, start, you have to put earplugs in. Have you ever been around a lawnmower and, and it's about 107 decimals and you've got a, you're pushing that lawnmower and somebody's yelling at you to, to turn it off because there's something going on in the house? Loudness of life. The loudness of life. At 125 decimals, damage to your ears start to happen. At 100 feet away from a, a jet, it's 140 decimals. It's super, super loud. It starts to kill your ears at 180 decimals. The loudness of life is, is uh, from, 100, from 0 to 194, 195, is very 
soft and very loud. If you're, you're, you're to hear somebody, you, they have to speak over those loud decimals at least 15 decimals higher. That's why you can hear somebody yelling at you as you're mowing the lawn and they're trying to speak 15 decimals higher than what you are in that, with that mower there, mowing. It's like a snow go and you're idling that snow go in front of you and, you're, and people are trying to tell you something in that as the loudness of life. So the question is, how much louder does the Lord have to speak to get your attention? How much louder does the Lord have to speak to get your attention? I'll just tell you this. I know this for, as, as a family. My, my parents, my in-laws were alive, and, and we were sitting around the table during Thanksgiving. And, and they're the type of people, I, my wife would, should, would tell you this, that when we went to, she would come to my house for Thanksgiving in Idaho. A lot of times, my wife and my mom would work and work and work and work and work. And then by the time the meal was served up, we would eat, and then we'd all leave. My wife's like, what? Why are you guys leaving the table? You should be sitting and talking. But at her family house, they would sit for all day, basically, and they'd put the food away and come back, and, but they were considered loud talkers. Are you guys loud? Is there anybody here loud talkers? <laughs> There's a few of you here. Loud talkers. And I would have to jump up, and I would have to put my hand up in the air because I wanted them to hear me because it was, I was not, I'm not a loud talker. And I would try to get their attention because I had a good comment to give them. And they were so much louder in their, in their, uh, in their conversation. Amen. I had to get my voice at least 15 decimals just so I could be noticed in my family. There's a lot of sounds in our world Everywhere, a lot of things are trying to get our attention today. A lot of things are trying to get our attention today. They're trying to get our attention. These things that are most important for us is Jesus. Jesus wants our attention. My question for you again is, how loud does the Lord have to be to speak to us to get our attention? How loud does he have to be? Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am what? I am God, and I will be exalted among my, the heathen, and I will be exalted on this earth. In the loudness of life, the Lord is saying, be still and know that I am God. The Lord does not want to have to talk louder than any other noise in the room, he wants us to be quiet and hear him. Instead of, and instead of the Lord desires that we will be still. Amen? So that he can speak to us in a loving tone, in a, in a symp sympathy, of, or in a, in a voice for his people. So we will listen and hear what he has to say to all of us. In the loudness of life, the Lord is saying, I don't want to speak 15 decimals higher. I want you in my life, where I don't have to speak louder. He speaks to us by being still and knowing that he is our God. In the loudness of life, are you taking the time to be still and listen to him? And know that he is your God and he is your Savior. In the loudness of life, with all the sounds and all the life and all the experiences and all these things around us, are you taking the time that is necessary so that you can be still and hear his voice? Mark Finley says this. In the, what he does in the morning, Mark Finley's a speaker, and he takes his slippers and he takes them off and, as he goes to bed, and he throws them under the bed, and when he gets up in the morning, he's got to get on his knees. And so while he's on his knees automatically, he starts to pray there in the quietness of the morning with his Savior and his Lord. So we need to listen to what he has to say. What does it mean to be 
dis distracted. What does it mean to be distracted in our lives? What is it? It, it's a causing, it's a turning away, it's a focus from what you have been doing to what you are there to do. I remember my father. My father and me would, would watch TV and and my dad would come home, he was an x-ray tech, and so he would work and work and work and work, and he had to run to the hospital and do things, and then he would come home, and he had to work a lot. But I remember him being in front of the, the TV, watching TV, and my mom is working and working and working and working on the meal. And she comes out in front of the television, she says, okay, about 15 minutes, the food will be ready. Okay, she leaves, and, and uh, he sits there and watches another program, and Five minutes before and five minutes before. And then finally, it was time, and she, she would go out with a candle changer. She would click, turn that thing off, and she said, I told you it would be in five minutes, and it's been 20 minutes. What are you doing still here? In the loudness of life. We need to be still and know that he is Lord. Loudness of life. We need to take time to make time from our busy days to be still and know the Lord. So that, so that the Lord does not have to speak 15 decimals higher, but he speaks right to you. Rather, we should speak, and he knows he's talking to us. Speak louder, servant. Speak louder. When my mother was trying to get my dad's attention, his focus was not on my mom, but on the television. So often our noise that gets us so busy in life that we forget Jesus wants to speak to us. Trying to pull our focus from the most important thing, and that is Jesus. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself as to have apprehended, but one thing I do Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing, he says, Paul says, pressing forward to those things which are before us. The world is trying to, to, to get our attention in every little aspect. It's trying to gain our attention so it can gain it and get us focused so much on one thing. And the loudness of life is trying to get our attention. The decibel levels in our world are louder and louder and louder, is getting higher and higher and higher. See, the devil knows that his time is short and he wants to distract us to one thing and get us to look away. It's trying to pull us away, trying to put us away in this way and that way and this way and that way to be still and know that I am God sometimes is difficult. I remember we have, a, we have a dog down in the lower 48. Her name is Daisy Lou. It's a southern name. It's called Daisy Lou. And she's a hound dog. She has these goofy little ears, long ears, and she's got this nose that is, doesn't quit. I don't know if you've been around a hound dog, but they can, they've got to sniff every little thing. And she's that way in her life. She, she will, you'll take her for a walk, and Gina, she'll come back from the walk, and she'll say, oh my goodness, my arm's about jerked off because it's going this way and this way because she's got to go over here to sniff this and over here to sniff this and over here to sniff this. She's always constantly, her nose is overworking all the time. It's busy, busy, busy. Sometimes that's the same thing with a phone call, isn't it? We, we, we get so distracted with phone calls and this and it, with TV programs and all this. But sometimes we need to sit down and read the Word of God. Why? Because sometimes, even in the Word of God, have you ever done the same thing? You're reading the Word of God in the morning and, and you're getting into it, but all of a sudden there's a distraction. It's, I've got to work on the car. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Even on, when you're on your knees and you're praying to God, there's these times where the, the, the distractions of life get you moving this way and this way and this way. God is calling us to be in the Word of God. There's three stories I want to use today. Three stories out of the Word of God of distractions that we would understand. So if you want to open your Bibles to Genesis 3, and we'll start with Eve. She is a good distraction. She had a distraction in her life. Starting with Genesis 3 and verse 1. Down to almost, down to six. 
see him in when you get there. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to this, the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of, the tree, of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree to, of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be what? They'll be opened, and, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that there was the, the, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and, the, and a tr tree desiring to make one wise, she took it of it fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and her husband ate. Eve was distracted, wasn't she? Think about this. She, she was able to walk with God in the cool of the day. Wouldn't that be awesome? She was able to walk with him in the cool of the day in the garden there and, and take time with him and, and be with him and love him and be there with him. They had everything they needed right there in the Garden of Eden. They, couldn't, they could eat of every tree except those two. Of every tree. Wow, isn't that crazy? They could do all this and have all this. There were no other people to distract them. They could sit there and listen to the Lord in his beauty. Abundant blessings. What a relationship that could have been. But see, it says in Genesis 3 and verse 1, as we take it back to verse 1, and the serpent was more subtle than any beast. God said, you know, God said, you, you shall not, you can eat anything in the Garden of Eden. You, you see, this decibel level had, was very low, but the serpent was very cunning. In verse 3 there, it says, Hath God said? He makes that question, Has God said? He tries to get the, the thought into Eve's mind to make her question, What is true? To distract her from the, the wonderful relationship, the fellowship that she had with her Savior and Lord. What does she fall prey to? The devil's got her attention. She, she has, was dis distracted. It says in verse 6 there, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, her own lust distracted her. John talks about the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life gets the distraction moved from one place to the next. These di different lusts, these different passions, these different desires, these were the things she was distracted by in her life. She was no longer interested in the still, small voice of the Lord. She was no longer waiting to be still and hear the voice of the Lord. She, and what he had to say, she was, dis, she was distracted. Sin is that way. It distracts us from the real meaning. It lures us. It, it brings us in, and it, it looks inviting, like, like Eric said there in Sabbath school. It, it looks good. It, it's good for a season, but it is not good forever. It takes us down. The second story, and that is Martha. Luke 10, take us, open your Bibles to Luke 10, verse 38. Luke 10, verse 38, starting with. The fruit there in, in, in her life was louder than the still, small voice. Luke 10, 38 says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, 
And a certain woman named Martha became, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Verse 41 says this, And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Again, we, we have this wonderful relationship with Martha and Mary. Mar Mary's G Mary, Jesus Christ was her friend. And I can imagine having that face-to-face -face relationship. He would enter into their city, and, and they would know it, and they would run to see who he, when he was coming. He would be able to enjoy him, and there with their comfortable and their best friend. There was no, you know, one thing I've learned as a pastor, sometimes it's, it's a beautiful thing to go to somebody's home and, and not to hear the gossip and not to hear all these things happening, and you can almost, whew. do you understand what I'm saying? It's beautiful. And I can imagine Jesus just being there. And he can just relax in that place. Because that's where he was able to do. She, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I understand, you know, we always want to make, we'd want to make the best for Jesus. If, the, if Jesus was here, we'd want to have it, have it perfect. We'd want to have the food perfect and the bed perfect. And all these things perfect for Jesus. But the Lord said something to Martha. Martha, Martha, you are wearied and troubled about many things. You're encumbered with all the life issues. You're distracted with various things. But there's one thing that's needful. There is one thing that's primary. There's one thing that is important. To sit at the feet of Jesus and learn and listen from him is the most important thing. To be still and know that I am God. Yet Martha was distracted with these things. She was distracted with the loudness of activity. She had to hustle and bustle and move here and there. She had to do this and do that. She neglected the most important thing, and that was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Luke says it this way, Luke 10, 42, but one thing is needed, needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha had the same choice, but she was busy. Yes, the volume is getting higher. The decibels are getting higher. The distractions are getting higher and higher. But we need to have that choice. Either sit at the feet of Jesus and, and enjoy who he really is in your life. Listen to him in that still small voice. This is what we need to do. We should choose like Mary to did and sit there at the feet of Jesus and learn from him. There are many times we need to be active in our service for the Lord. But there is most times we need to be spending time with him. Eve was distracted by the fruit. Mary was distracted by the activities of life. Now let's go to James. Let's go to, I'm sorry, go to Mark 10, 35. We're going to talk about James and John. They had a goal in their life. They had a goal to be able to sit within the, the comfort of their immediate place there and have uh, be able to say we did this and we did this and we did this. Mark 10 35 if you're there. When James and John the sons of Zebedee came to him and saying teacher we want you to do for us whether we ask. <laughs> Isn't that a crazy statement? Do whatever we ask. 
And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, in verse 38, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Again, we see the privilege of this group, right? The privilege of this group. They, they were with the 12 disciples. They were with the, the Lord, and they were with him as he was translated to heaven. What a privilege. Yet, what distracted them? It was the ambition of their own hearts that distracted them. They were not able to hear that still, small voice. They were distracted by the noise of life. They were distracted by the noise of their ambition. They could just get something in their lives. They were looking around and saw all the Roman rulers in their high ruling positions. And if we, were, we are there, if they, if they were thinking, if we were there in our own able, ability, we might be able to stand in the, in the inner circle of these groups. Why did he, that's why they're asking him, why can't you put us in the inner circle? To put us in the place of prominence and authority. And the Lord says, you're being, you're being distracted from the, the things that matter most. Jesus says in, in, in Mark 10, 38, But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I can drink and the baptism that, the baptism that I will be baptized with? Do you see Jesus you see Jesus. You hear his voice. Do you hear the, the loudness of life? And do you want to spe spend time with him? In the loudness of life, are you still able to stand with him? He wants you to stand with him, to be a part of him today. In the loudness of life, he's saying, come and hear my voice. Step aside and be a part of me. In the loudness of life, I want you to be a part of me. That's why I believe that this hymn that we're going to sing now, this hymn that we're going to sing is Silent Night. On that one hill there in, in Jerusalem, where, where the shepherds were, I could imagine them being quiet because they're sitting there at night guiding those sheep around. They're making sure that there's no wolves, there's no distractions, but they're listening. And they've been talking together about this thing called uh, Jesus, and everything's happening, and they're talking about it there. And it's interesting as they're there listening and talking and, and discussing, and all of a sudden the angel comes and talks to them. I don't know about I'd be scared to death if an angel came to me. But they're there in the silence of night. And page 143, if you'd open your hymnals to page 143, Silent Night, Holy Night. Please stand. 143. Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is bright Round yon virgin mother and child Holy infant so tender and mild Sleep in heavenly peace Sleep in heavenly peace Silent night, holy night, darkness flies, all is light, shepherds hear the angels sing, alleluia to the King, Christ the 
Savior is born, Christ our Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace jesus lord at thy birth jesus lord at thy birth silent night holy night wondrous star lend thy light with the angels let us sing alleluia to our king christ the savior is born christ the savior is bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. And I pray as we remember today to to turn off the decibels, to turn off the sound and take the time with you in that quiet voice and get to know you better this Christmas season. As you have wanted to get to know us so badly and love us so dearly, we pray that in the loudness of life, that you would come apart with us and we could be with you. In your name, amen. Amen.